Okay. Well, uh, it's it is truly a pleasure to be here and speaking uh, speaking with all of you. Um, so I will be talking about scattering amplitudes, um, and I know this is this is uh, you know we, everybody in this room cares about um, cares about making predictions that are going to touch reality. So uh, can can everybody hear me? Is is the is this mic working effectively? Should I? Anyone? And okay, good. All right. So let me know. Let me know if you if you um, if you have uh, any trouble hearing me. And so so what what I'm going to be focusing on is trying to give you guys some of the ways that I approach making predictions. And this is something that's been very fruitful for us as a field. I'm not going to be spending. Um, I'm not going to be spending a ton of time on formal proofs. Some of the things I'll be talking about are empirically discovered, and we're still trying to understand why. Some of the things have proofs, and those proofs aren't spectacularly enlightening. And some of them have proofs that are incredibly elegant, but I'm not going to have time to go into them. So I'll give you references for where those are as they come up. Um, what I will be doing is I'll be spending a lot of time talking about gauge theories because I like gauge theories, and our world likes gauge theories, and gauge theories are really useful. And I'll also spend a fair bit of time talking about how you can turn predictions about gauge theories into predictions about gravitational theories. And this isn't just because I like gravity, but I do like gravity. It's because uh, this is also now useful. We have, uh, we have observed uh, gravitons, um, or at least uh, you know, classical limits. And this is uh, some of our most precise measurements, sorry, most precise predictions that are incredibly relevant to next generation gravitational wave observatories are arrived at by applying the techniques and the ideas that we'll be talking about today. Um, and besides, uh, besides uh, calculating in theories we know, <laughs> or at least we think we know what we're supposed to be talking about, I'm also going to spend a little bit of time uh, discussing some rather new ideas towards calculating an effective field theories. I know you've had some spectacular lectures about effective field theories, and you'll uh, continue to have spectacular, lect uh, spectacular lectures about effective field theories. Uh, I think what I'm going to focus on is that they're a spectacular way of parameterizing our ignorance uh, of fields we don't know about, interactions we don't know about, using the fields we have at hand and the understanding of the symmetries we have at hand to talk about predictions at scales and the languages relevant to those scales. Um, but the way I'm going to be talking about this is going to be very uh, prediction oriented. I'll be talking about various ways of distributing your derivatives consistently in your predictions as you're talking about higher derivative operators in the fields at hand, uh, in ways that don't mess up gauge invariance and don't mess up the other symmetries you've come to rely on in constructing your amplitudes. Um, OK. So with, with, that, with that sort of preamble, uh, I'm going to get to it. But, but I, I'd really like to emphasize at the start that what we're going to be talking about is amplitudes as a way of talking about theories, as discussing the theories themselves. And, and one of the nice features of uh, using amplitudes to discuss your theories is it's part and parcel with the predictions at hand. And this doesn't mean that we're going to neglect symmetries uh, at all. In fact, we're going to use symmetries to bootstrap our amplitudes. Uh, and we can do this starting from you know, very low multiplicity tree level and go on up to the relevant level of precision we care about. And so, so uh, all of my lectures are going to be, um, you know, I'll be talking a fair bit about tree level stuff. And I'll give an overview and, and an introduction to some of the tools we really use when we're going after loops. But the whole language that I'll be talking about is, um, is inspired and relevant to how we talk about things at loop level. So it's not going to be special to tree level or special to four dimensions. Um, oh, well, we live in four dimensions, right? So, so why, why, why aren't I going to specialize to four dimensions right away? And I'll tell you, well, how do we regulate gauge theories without breaking uh, gauge invariance? Dim reg. And so what does that mean? 
That means we're going away. Even, even at our underground, we're going a little bit away, right? And if we constructed things using only four-dimensional information, there is, there is data we lose. There's data we throw out that's inaccessible if we strictly consider four dimensions. And so we're going to talk about things in a very d-dimensional way. Right, and then specialize to four dimensions when convenient or when necessary or when useful, especially on external X. Um, okay, good. So, how do we calculate at loops? Okay, well. Not with Feynman diagrams. Um, off shell, they're unwieldy. And the factorial number of diagrams, as you increase either multiplicity or loop level, the number of diagrams you have to write down, unless you're dealing with the most special theory, generically the number of diagrams you have to write down grow factorially, not exponentially, factorially, with the number of legs and with the number of loops. Okay. This means that if you're in the amplitudes business, with finite computers and finite understanding, since we haven't solved very many theories, there's always more work to do. You just go up in loop level, you go up in multiplicity, and you've got a challenge that saturates your computational bound, right? And it's not going to get better by any exponential growth in computing facilities. What you need are new ideas, new approaches, recognitions of symmetries, or understanding that your, your predictions are going to be limited to certain regimes, right? Maybe you can take certain limits that let you go farther, and then you can talk about that. So, so, so and this, is something, this is something that confronts us in any sort of perturbative expansion, right? And so this is, this is just this is part of our life. All right, so, so not with Feynman diagrams. but still graph organized. All right, so unitarity methods. Which we will be discussing uh, a fair, oh, go for it. <laughs> Um, I mean actual graphs, <laughs> but I'll, 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 I'll get there in a second. Yeah, so, so we're still going, we're still going to, we're still going to, um, we're still going to talk about, uh, you know, expansion in terms of a coupling constant, so you coupling constants all your vertices and count, you got a coupling constant, stripe by coupling constants, the number of external edges. And you can also have, you know, uh, you know, some some mass, dim mass dimensions that you include and in stray by that. But I actually mean, I actually mean stuff that's a lot like Feynman diagrams, of which there's a factorial number, right? That shows how things are conserved with some certain number of external points. How momentum's conserved, how color is conserved, you know, how flavor is conserved, right? That makes manifest locality and via unitarity makes manifest consistency. So you know you're talking about the same theory you were talking about a lower loop order or a lower multiplicity. Um, but yeah, so, so but I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you the types of graphs in just a second. But I just want to give some broad, some broad points. All right, so unitarity methods, they're efficient. for both verification 
and construction. I'm not sure how many symbols I just added to construction. We R U C construction. All right, so and I'll talk about what utility methods are. They are uh, just just so you have something in your head. They're uh, they're they're taking what you know about factorization, what has to happen with factorization, to the integrands of loop level. Okay, and so uh, so it's a tool to make sure that what you've written down, if somebody hands you some integrand, that you know that you can verify it's for the theory that they say it, that it is. Uh, but whenever you have something that's efficient for verification, you can always invert the problem and turn that into a method for construction. So it's something we can definitely do. And so, but, but this relies, crucially, on organizing things in terms of graphs. In order to use unitarity methods efficiently, they have to be organized in terms of graphs. And we, have, we still have to integrate over a loop momenta. And all our techniques for doing multi-loop integration require, um, require local representations. Right? So it turns out that for, for many theories, for some theories at least, some theories of interest, uh, it's possible to very quickly write down non-local representations that are very compact of the integrand, right? But if you want to actually compare it with data, you have to integrate. And we don't know how to, I mean, multi-loop integrals are hard. You're integrating over all space and time. You're picking up the residues of all the poles, right? That's, that's what your integration does for a living. And our techniques for doing this type of integration, the ones that we can use generally want local representations. So even if you had some sort of non-local representation that was nice and compact, once you want to integrate, you're often using unitarity methods to cast things into a local graph organized form. I, I will in just a second. But yeah, but what I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, we're sitting, on, we're sitting on propagators, the same type of propagators you know and love that satisfy the Green's functions for the free theory you care about. When they're on shell, that's zero. And when they're off shell, there's some momenta that's sitting there. Um, yeah. All right, so, so good. All the, all the questions are leading exactly where I want to go. So what do I mean by a graph organized, a graph organized integrand? So let's talk about it for gauge theories. I have some various colored chalks I can, let's see. Good. So. So this is a labeled topology. So, so what I want for my graph integrand is a map from, not frop, from labeled topologies where are the labels? Here are the labels. 
And I've also subtly encoded some labeling in the colors and the waviness of my lines. All right? That's the label topology. Two color weights. I'm often going to talk about flavor weights and color weights in exactly the same way. So I'm just going to call them color weights. Um, so, for example, a vertex like this gets mapped to an FABC, right? It's a structure constant, whatever gauge group I'm considering. Something like this. Get mapped to whatever arbitrary generator associated with the gauge group that, uh, that this guy lives in. Okay. This mapping's fairly straightforward, right? You know, it, it tell, you know, it's part and parcel talking about what you're talking about with the theory, right? So, we want color weights. We want propagator weights. Um, I should say, okay, so everything I'm gonna be talking about for these lectures, all the examples I'll be doing, all the things I know really well are scattering amplitudes in relativistic quantum field theory, so Lorentz invariant, scattering amplitudes in flat space time. Okay? Um, what are interesting things that aren't in flat space time and Lorentz invariant relativistic quantum field theories? Are <laughs> you oh, good? So maybe cosmological correlators on an expanding background, right? Or, or, uh, or correlators in a classical effective field theory of dark matter interacting via Newtonian potential on a on a large background, right? So this is something that's either not going to be a flat space time or not going to be a Lorentz invariant, right? Everything I'm going to be talking about is Lorentz invariant in flat space time. The nice thing is many of these ideas carry over. And so you'll, you'll, you'll notice over the past, um, oh, over the past many months, but certainly over the past year, there have been this spectacular collection of, of uh, you know, snow mass papers that are very readable for everybody, that are great guides to literature. Um, I think one thing that's exciting for me to see is the type of advancement that people have been making in, um, in the cosmological bootstrap program, which uses many of the ideas and approaches that we're applying to flat space-time scattering amplitudes. But that's not the end of the story by any means. There are all sorts of people for us to speak to, and physics shouldn't be very balkanized. We should be speaking to all sorts of people, whether, whether they're very, very formal string theorists. Why should we speak to very formal string theorists? Because they've got an effective field theory that goes all the way to the top. Right? And we can learn a lot from even taking a low energy expansion, looking at the type of looking at the type of operators that appear and how they can be constructed, and watching how they're resummed in interesting ways. Right? We can we can learn a lot by speaking to our to our condensed matter friends who often don't care so much about Lorentz invariance, right? But do care about prediction. Um, and so developing, developing languages that let us bridge the gap, that make it easier for us to calculate, are worth doing. I'm just saying this because I'm about to write down something that's very specific to Lorentz invariant uh, relativistic field theories, which are in flat space time, which is that our propagators, right, are always going to look like something like, you know, whatever momentum running across minus whatever mass of the particle. Yeah. Oh, and you can tell what signature, you can tell what signature I'm in if you look at this. But anyway, so, so, uh, so if, just so we're all on the same page. So if I have loop, loop momenta one running this way 
and this propagator, right? So what, sorry, running this way, along this edge, what propagator do I get for somebody like this? So it's a gluon, and gluons are, ma are gluons massive or massless? Pardon me? Well, I want to hear that much louder. Are gluons massive or massless in flat space time? Massless, that's right. And so, okay, so, so what's the propagating rate? Are you raising your hand to answer or to ask a question? Okay, very good. Good. That, I haven't told, I, the only subtle hint I've told, okay, good. So let me, let's, let me give a key. All right, so I'm thinking that these are going to be some, some massless gauge boson, like a gluon. I'm thinking this is going to be some sort of fermion, and this will be some sort of fermion, okay? And if you want, I can even, I can even draw some, some lines so we care about so we care about which, which one's a, a particle and which one's an antiparticle. Okay? Yep. So the fermions and we are using different colored lines. Uh, are you meaning they're different by flavors or different by Yeah, flavors? maybe different mass, different flavor. Sure. Uh, totally different fermions. Different fermions. Yep. Oh, oh, good, good. Okay. Sorry. First of all, I should never say obvious when lecturing. That was, a, that was a, a, a bad habit. I meant obvious to me because I've been doing this for about 15 years. <laughs> all right? Um, and, and, and I should say c consistent with a certain, a certain way of drawing diagrams. Anyway, so, so this, so gluons are charged in the adjoint. Right, gluons, gluons couple in the adjoint. So this is going to be the, uh, the structure constant for whatever gauge group I'm talking about, right? So if it's QCD, if it's QCD, what's my gauge group? SU3, right. And so, so this would be charged in the adjoint, but I'm not gonna write down numbers, and I'm gonna keep this real generic, because there's an advantage to keeping this real generic, because then I can recycle it for predictions in various theories. If I wanted to turn this into a QED calculation instead of QCD, then I turn this into a zero, right? This gets a zero, but I get to use, well, so, so this diagram's out, right? But, but other diagrams will survive, right? So, 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 so I'm gonna keep it fairly generic about my gauge group, because I'm gonna be caring more about the properties these guys have with each other, and that these guys have with each other. I'm sure this T probably wasn't very easy to read, let me. All right, and so, okay, and so, and I didn't even say that these guys were in the fundamental, right? Like, oh, we like our quarks in the fundamental. It, you know, we can write down all sorts of theories, right? So it's whatever arbitrary representation it has. Maybe it's even in the adjoint, okay? And if it's in the adjoint, it's massless, then maybe I'm talking about one small part of a supersymmetric, supersymmetric amplitude. Okay, good, but back to my, okay, D more, more, good? Okay. And then, sorry, last question about that, is the T the generator? Yeah, yeah, okay. yep, just the generator. Generator for the arbitrary representation that I haven't told you it is, but it's, the, it's this representation. And maybe this guy's in a different representation, okay? The only thing I've t for this for this theory, which I haven't told you anything about, yes, that 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 these particular wavy lines are gluons in you know massless gluons in, in some representation of some gauge adjoint representation of the gauge group. Um, good. So back to the question I asked you: What does this propagator look like? This blue wavy line. Okay, good, yeah. So I'm just going to say it's going to get a 1 over L squared. <laughs> right? Yeah, a G mu and blah, blah, blah. But no, so, so delta good. AB. Huh? Delta yeah. AB. Yeah, yeah, delta AB, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, good. And but see, but the thing is, the thing is, I'm not going to, 
I'm not actually going to be, I, we're not going to be writing these down like Feynman rules. So, so what I'm really, what, what really going to have is a mapping to a color weight that is going to be, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be the product over all these. And yes, I'm going to have implied, uh, implied deltas on the propagators and, and blah, blah, blah. But it's, it, th this, this, this color weight for this graph will have its, you know, it will be something. Right, it'll be something, and it and it's not, and this something, because yeah, it's it's just gonna live on its own, and this mapping propagator weights is gonna live on its own, okay, and so so, but still, just so we're all on the same on the same page, we do conserve momentum at propagators. Oh, and everything I'm gonna do, I should I should put this in big letters somewhere. Maybe I'll put it big letters here. Everything I'll do is an all outgoing convention. So I'm going to take all my external momentum outgoing. Why? It makes my life so much easier. Uh, OK, good. But these, these, aren't, these aren't the interesting these aren't the interesting weights. There's one more weight. And, and that's, that's, this is very generic, right? This, this is all very, very, very generic. The thing that's going to get specific to what particular theory I'm talking about is, is a kinematic weight. And we typically call these kinematic weights numerators. Because after you've modded out the propagators, there's nothing left downstairs that's kinematic. OK? I, I'm just going to finish my sentence, then I'm going to, and what's this kinematic weight going to depend on? It's going to depend on external momenta, and it's going to depend on loop momenta, and it's going to depend on external polarizations when relevant, and it'll depend on you know, fermion bilinears when relevant. It's where all the theory-specific stuff goes, OK? So that, and, and notice, I, I'm calling this an, an integrand. Well, this is a graph organized integrand. So I've got three separate mappings from every graph to something, to a color weight, to the propagator structure, and to this kinematic weight, right? And you could say, oh, well, if I'm integrating, Right, then you know, however many, uh, however much, you know. So I've got d dimensions. However, uh, you know, however many loop orders I have. You know, one, two, three, four, I guess. Uh, and then I'd have my numerator weight for this graph, my color weight for this graph, and you know, my denominator, my propagator weight for this graph, right? Um, and in a sense, that's true. I mean, depending upon what graphs you're summing over, you may have to mod out by symmetry factors you know, from, and stuff like that. But in essence, I mean, you sh you sh maybe, maybe you recognize something like this as being associated with a Feynman diagram, right? That when you're building up an integrand from Feynman diagrams, you end up with something that looks like this, OK? And what I'm saying is that the way we calculate it loops is finding maps from topologies to these things. And these ones we don't worry about because they're easy for the theories we we're talking about. And these are the ones we worry about. OK. You had a question, and then you had a question. Yeah. And can you see, just so I know, can you see from? OK. Um, uh, maybe. Uh, so, so let me let me let me repeat your question. So you said, you said, am I calling these weights because I'm actually treating them as weights? And then you said something about eigenvalues, and then and then I, I lost like it. Weights, <laughs> weights, 
Weights of representation. Oh, 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 good. Um, oh. Um, I think that's possible. That's not what I have in mind. So, so, so what I so 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 I'm using the word weights because it's a smaller word than mappings. And if I said mappings too many times, my tongue would fall off. Uh, but 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 I also I'll also let me. That's a good here. Let me. So, I will often say mappings. I'll often say weights, and I'll often say dressings. And I mean the same thing. I mean something that takes me from a graph, a labeled topology, to a something, to a something that's an expression I can integrate or cut or do something with. But you know, so so it's a it's a it takes me from topology to an actual expression. Each of these three expressions, I will contribute. I will I I will bring together. For example, so one thing I can do is actually build the integrand that I'm going to integrate. That's one thing I can do with these maps. That's not the only thing I can do with these maps. With these maps, I can very quickly build this representation's version of all sorts of unitarity cuts. And because I'm dealing with a gauge theory, I can talk about something called color ordered cuts, which I don't expect you guys to know about just yet, but I will tell you about. And they are simpler gauge invariant building blocks of full color dressed cuts. And because this stuff is simple, it lets me isolate this in small gauge invariant building blocks. OK? Good. That was a, that was a great question. Your question? Um, thanks. Is, the, is, a full, uh, is a theory fully and uniquely defined by the combination of these three weights? Wow. Good. Um, for, for, for is, is, is a theory's, is a theory's Are you asking if a theory is fully determined by its S matrix? Uh, maybe a simpler question than that. Just like if you have these three types of weights and you can write them all out, is your theory fully defined? Good. So, so if I can do this, if I can do this for every topology, then uh, then yes. Yeah. Yeah. Said said another way. Let's talk about, well, so, so two different theories, two different theories can have the same scattering amplitudes at the same multiplicity in loop order. For example, Einstein-Hilbert gravity at tree level, its five-point scattering amplitudes between five gravitons is the same scattering amplitude as, uh, as five gravitons at tree level in n equals eight supergravity, right? So. Um, so just specif specifying a particular amplitude doesn't tell you what theory you're in. But specifying all amplitudes definitely tells you what theory you're in. Um, were there any other questions? Oh, good. Good. So. Right. So, um, this, 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 is, this, is, this is an answer we're going to iterate on, because I'm going to say too many words right now. The simplest thing is the graph, right? And there's a graph, which means I've got, a, uh, I've got, edges, I've got edges connecting vertices. Edges connecting nodes, right? Um, two, two topologies are definitely distinct if there's no isomorphism between them. If there's no way of relabeling one so that it has exactly the same connectivity and labels as the other. Okay? So that's the first level of distinct. Now, this has more information than just. Um, than just connectivity between edges and nodes. For example, does anybody remember any properties about FABCs? They're anti-symmetric. That's a fantastic property. Okay? 
And so what that means is that A, B, C, like F, A, B, C like this, F is B minus F, B, A, C, right? That, that my, my, my nodes, my nodes care about the order in which the edges come into them. Okay, so, so my topology has structure. I would have a different color weight if I moved this A over here, for example, right? I'd have a minus sign, yeah, just because of these FABs. So, so, so my graphs have structure. Beyond that, I'm talking about different particle types here and here, right? And so, so, so it's not necessarily a given that my kinematic weight will necessarily, or my propagator, or whatever, you know, be related under, under, under swaps of particle types, okay? Although that's something, well, that, that, that actually gets to, the, to my next point. Is that, is that a good enough answer for right now? Yeah, she was, at, I mean, just in case, I don't think I repeated the question. She was asking, what makes the topologies uh, unique or independent? And, um, and how do you distinguish between them? And so, so, so at lowest order, you distinguish between them with graph isomorphism, but then whatever other structure you're imbuing the graphs to capture the theories you care about. Okay. All right, good. All right, so. Now, what do I want my weights to do for a living? My, I want my weights to satisfy certain properties, okay? Um, weights. In my notes, I said weights should obey, but, but that sounds so oppressive, so they're just gonna satisfy. They're gonna satisfy symmetries. the topology. Um, all right. Oh, you know what? For everybody to see this, I should probably do this on the central board. Um, well, here's a question. You in the peach shirt over there? Can you see this graph, or is it a big mess? It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Here. You know what? I'm going to give a copy to you. Everybody will get a copy. Hold, hold on. So I'll do one copy over here and one copy over there. But of course, I left my blue chalk over here. So this just, I get a little more exercise, which is fine, because I need a little more exercise. And all right, good. All right, so I'm, I'm, I'm moving my gluon line over to, to make the graph more symmetric so there's more ambiguity into how to map certain, you know, labels to some sort of canonical representation. All right, so I'll just call, all right, so um, A, B, C, D, E, and we draw a similar graph over here. Except I left the yellow chalk over here. <laughs> Need a chalk caddy or something. All right. Are those graphs the same? Yeah, anybody in the center, can they tell me if I've, if I've made any errors? Good, all right. Well, what? Oh, ha -ha. that, okay, good, that doesn't matter, but, but that's a great, oh, sorry. 
Good. So the problem was that good. I'm glad. I'm glad you're paying attention. Yeah. So 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 I guess. I guess is that better? Does that look? Does that look exactly the same? Okay. Good. All right. And. A. All right, good. Um, I, what, 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 what's going on? The arrows. The arrows. I'm not going to draw the arrows. <laughs> Do you want me to draw the arrows? What did I choose over there anyway? Okay. Oh, good. Well, ha ha. <laughs> so <laughs> now I'm going to be sneaky and I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn these massive fermions into massive scalars. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. So now they're massive scalars, um, and and it's just it's just for it's just to make a point. Okay. If they were fermions, then I'd be breaking I'd be breaking too much symmetry. There'd be no ambiguity. But now they're massive scalars, and maybe they're in a real representation, so you don't care. Somebody's you know incoming or doesn't matter. Okay. So. Maybe they're in the adjoint. It's fine. Um, good. So let me let me give the new key. The new key. Massive scalars in the adjoint. And still a moon. Oh, and I'm going to, I'm always, I'm always going to refer to massless Yang Mills bosons as gluons. I'm not going to reserve that for SU3. So just in case you hear me say gluon, 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 I'm not always talking about SU3. You know, I'm just talking about, you know, massless gauge bosons for Yang Mills. Um, all right, good. All right, weight should satisfy the symmetries of the topology. So, ooh, and now I get to be sneaky. So, let me see if I have any more colored chalk. Otherwise, oh, I do, good. This is great. All right, so, aha. Uh -huh. Outgoing, K2 outgoing, K3 outgoing, K4 outgoing, K5 outgoing. All right, so should when I'm mapping from this guy to this guy, should a go to K1, B go to K4, E go to K3, or A go to K4, B go to, wait, 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 nope, nope, golly, golly, B go to K, <laughs> see that's a problem, not copying things out of my notes, all right, K1, K5, or K4, or should this be K4, this be K5, and this be uh, K1. First of all, do we agree that A going to K1, B going to K5, and, and C 
C going to K4 is one valid isomorphism from that graph to this graph? Yeah? Oh, sorry. This is this is supposed to be a K four, four, and this is one, two, three, five. Right? Or see, but but either either could work, right? There's nothing that tells me I should be choosing one over the other, right? And so all of my mappings shouldn't care. They can't care, right? Be a useful map, right? If there's no information that tells me how to go from a topology to a dressing, then my dressing can't depend on it, OK? And what that means is that that these numerate, well, specifically the numerate uh, of this, you can verify at home that this, that your color weights and your propagators will obey this. But whatever numerators work, well, go for it. Oh, thanks. Uh, do you care about the direction of time? Is that really what uh, differentiates those two choices? No, 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 no. So this is an all outgoing, it's all outgoing convention, right? So not at all. Could you define the all outgoing convention? Yeah, so, so. All my external momenta is going to satisfy k1 plus 2 plus k3 plus k4 plus k5 uh, equals uh, 0. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 of course, if you care, if you care about if you care about specifying, I've got two particles coming in, two particles going out, then you'll choose, you'll choose to set, you know, to set the momentum of, you know, let's say these two guys as opposite when you're just plugging it in, right? So you'll go from your K twiddle where you cared about these guys coming, being incoming to my Ks where I want everything outgoing. Yeah. Like a cro like a crossing symmetry. Yeah. Um. So so this is this is again this is this is all at the integrand level, okay. right? And and it's this is not this is this this is something if you were to have built it with Feynman rules, this is something you also would have gotten, right? Because it's just playing with graphs. It's just building out of small pieces of graphs. Okay, so so the, I don't. There's no content. There's no content to this other than it's a constraint on your on your kinematic weights that they have to satisfy the automorphisms of the graph. Um, uh, I'll write that down. Can, can, I, I didn't. I didn't drop too far below people's people's visual bound there. Hopefully, so let me take this up. So, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I've made no big claims about what happened. So, first of all, individual graphs don't mean anything unless they're gauge invariant by themselves. And individual graphs are rarely gauge invariant by themselves. Sometimes, sometimes they're the only thing that contributes to an amplitude, in which case then they do mean something, the amplitude. But, but um, right now I'm just talking about, talk, I'm, I'm trying to develop a shared language to talk about how we're going to approach calculation, okay? Um, and th this shared language, is one of identifying channels through which information can propagate, right, in the form of topologies, then finding some way of turning those topologies into physical predictions, okay? Um, 
And the way we're going to do that is by using our brains about symmetry. We're going to impose symmetry on these dressings. We're going to impose consistency constraints on these dressings. And this will let us bootstrap from very, very, very little to very, 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 to a whole bunch. <laughs> um, all right, so anyway, the numerator should satisfy, or our kinematic weight should satisfy, automorphic. Automorphisms of their graphs. So it can't matter. If there's an ambiguity, it can't matter which, which isomorphism I've chosen when I'm turning this graph into, uh, into a prediction, right? Um, so this is one constraint. Another is that um, our weights should satisfy all unitarity cuts. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to give, I'm going to give a more in-depth discussion of, of, of what cuts are in later lectures. And we're going to work through performing cuts with different types of states that can run across the cuts, OK? But what I want you to, so that this isn't a contentless bullet point on a chalkboard so you can go away with something for this lecture. Um, what I want you to, 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 to realize is, so generically, right, these kinematic weights that I've written down, you know, kinematic, whoa, for this graph, um, they, they, um, they, they, may, they may care that these external guys are on shell, right? But they shouldn't care at all about what, whatever loop momentum running inside is on shell, OK? But that doesn't stop me from asking a question from my set of mappings. What, what do I get if I start putting individual diagrams on shell in such a way that it's a product of gauge invariant lower multiplicity uh, or lower loop order objects, specifically cutting down to trees, right? And so, so you can imagine, you know, this, this is a fairly complicated diagram. Well, there's a, there's a complicated integrand because there are a lot of diagrams that can show up. Let me give you an integrand that's much simpler, just, just, to, just for the, the purposes of, of having something concrete so you can, you can leave with some notion of what unitarity cuts are doing. So, um, so I'm going to talk about n equals 4 super Yang Mills. That sounds really fancy. Uh, and it is. Oh, it's so fancy. But it's also so, so much simpler than any other gauge theory in four dimensions. Um, not because of the number of states. Ooh, it's got a ton of states. It's got you know, 16 states all running around inside. Right, but uh, but at least some of those states get to be gluons, right? So let's just talk about having gluons on the well. Anyway, so there are only two non-vanishing topologies at two loops four points for n equals four superangles, a planar double box and a non-planar double box. Can you guys see this? You guys, can everybody see? Everybody's, maybe I'm standing in the wrong place. Two topologies, OK? The color weights are just what they are. The, everything in, in n equals 4 super Yang mills is in the adjoint, so you just dress, you just dress all the vertices with FABCs. So everything is in adjoint. It's massless theory, right? So, 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 so. You know, so so all my propagators are just the loop, the momentum of running through them squared. Okay, um, kinematic weights. Turns out the kinematic. So I'm going to call this A B C D A B C D. The kinematic weight of this guy 
is equal to the kinematic weight of this guy, and it's equal to SAB, SBC, A, uh, A, B, B, C. Okay, what's SAB? Equals KA plus KB squared. And so SBC is just KB plus KC squared, all right? And this is just a four-point tree level, is a four-point tree level uh, scattering amplitude for, um, for the theory that's in its color order, it's, it's got, and it's got two channels. It's basically something sitting over, it's some, you know, some numerator sitting over SAB plus some numerator sitting over SBC. Um, and these numerators here contain all the external state information. And so if I set a, B, C, and D to all be gluons, then this is just the four-point ordered tree-level amplitude for four gluons. Okay. I don't expect you guys to know what this means or even how to use this yet, but you will by the end of next lecture. Um, but, but it lets me talk about cuts very easily. Well, go. Yes. You know what? This is what I'm going to do. Sorry, guys. But I think this will. So I'm going to define S equals KA plus KB squared. I'm going to define T equals KB plus KC squared. OK? And so the numerator is going to be S, T, and the four-point amplitude with an ST channel, OK? All right, hopefully this way I'm not drowning in, in too many subscripts. Um, good. Now, what you don't know, but you will know by the end of next lecture, is that for, for external gluons, actually for all of these amplitudes, this thing's actually a permutation invariant. So this is invariant under any labeling of A, B, and C, and D. OK? Um, oh, I lied. Times S. <laughs> Good. Sorry. Now it all makes sense. Good. So, so anyway, uh, times S. So this is, this, is, this is the dressing for two loops in N equals 4 superiangles. Um, Good. I can ask, since this, is, since this is two loops, I can say, oh, what would this representation give me on the occasion of putting, um, of putting three lines on shell? So, but in, in, a, in an ordered way. OK. So I'm going to consider tree-level amplitudes in my theory, two five-point amplitudes, and I'm going to sew them together, which means I'll be taking the product of them, and then I'll be allowing all the states in my theory to run across the cut. And so I'll sum over all the states that can run across all the cuts. OK? This is a gauge invariant, and this is a gauge invariant. Summing over different states running around it leaves me with something that's gauge invariant. It's true, no matter how I talked about it, how, wh however I'm telling the story, I'll get the same answer. This is gauge invariant. Okay? I can ask from my mapping what, what the integrand of two loops, n equals four superiang mills, will be on this cut. You see, it's got two loops, two external legs. External legs, two loops, right? Yes. It seems to be true that two tree 
level diagrams can give you a two loop diagram? How does that work? It, so it'll give me it'll give me it'll give me components of this on shell. And the way it works is uh, if you, if you, at its deepest, it's Cauchy's theorem, right? That that you're looking at the residues on poles, um, but uh, but but what what we're going to yeah. So so at the deepest, it's residues on poles, and so it will not give me the full amplitude, right? But by evaluating my integrand on certain kinematic conditions, right, I will be able to match this, or I won't match this. But if I don't match this, I have to start wondering if I'm talking about the theory I think I'm supposed to be talking about. Because this is something I should, could certainly be doing with Feynman rules on either side, right? And so I'd be looking at the diagrams that can contribute to cuts like this on either side. Now, what's true is the only thing that's necessary is any deviation between this and this has to vanish upon integration. Then I'm still talking about the theory. But what we're going to hold as sufficient is that it matches exactly at the integrand level without integrating. So that's a constraint we're going to put on our, on our kinematic weights, is that we're going to demand something stronger than necessary. So not that it not that it, it matches up to up to uh, you know total derivatives or integration zeros. We're going to demand that it matches exactly. Um, just just um, to be very clear about why graphs are very useful is what we could do if we were. Um, if we didn't like ourselves very much and we, were, we had a ton of time to waste, was write down a full integrand with all the labels and all the channels by adding up all the graphs with all the different labels and all the channels. Then start looking at, OK, if I'm going to label this 1, 2, L3, L2, L1, you know, minus L1, minus L2, minus L3, K3, K4. So then start putting things on shell. Right, and then looking at the residues of what's left over. But then why was I doing this to begin with? The reason I built it a map is so I could take the ordered tree level diagrams that contribute to this, you know, which will be stuff that looks like this, and then maybe stuff that looks like that, and so on, and take an outer product with the topologies that are sitting over here. Then dress them with a bunch of zeros for everything that doesn't look like this, but that this labeled appropriately. And that's got to match what happens when I actually do this with trees, when I actually sum over the states. That's the constraint I'm going to be playing. And that's what I mean by satisfying unitarity cuts. I realize this is a sketch. I realize that I haven't given you all the tools yet to do this, or to even talk about it consistently. But this is, this is where we're going. Okay? And where we're going to start getting good at this is we're going to start getting good at this at tree level. All right, we're going we're gonna to do this to start. We're going to constrain three-point amplitudes just by symmetry and mass dimension alone, little group scaling. That'll tell us what particles we're talking about. Then we'll start bootstrapping our way to higher multiplicity by satisfying unitarity cuts or factorization and, um, and whatever symmetry properties of the theory we're talking about. All right, and so once we get good at this at tree level, then we'll have all the tools we need to go after and do the same type of thing at loops. Okay. Good. So, um, all right. So, great. Uh, let's, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Okay. So, so let me summarize with. Nobody, does everybody okay if I erase this? Are we good? All right. So let me, su let me summarize with our recipe for calculation that's distinct from going after things with Feynman rules.
Kiev on Zatse. Actually, so I say give on Zatse to topologies, I mean to the kinematic weights of topologies. Okay? Who knows what I mean by on Zatse? All right, not a lot of people. So I, we're going to give a guess. Let me just, uh, we're going to give a guess. We're going to give a guess given what we know. It's got to be built out of Lorentz invariance. Whatever we write down, it's Lorentz invariance. So whatever is in the end has to be built from Lorentz invariance. It's got to have a certain mass dimension for the theory we're talking about sitting in front of the coupling we're talking about. So we'll give it as many orders in Lorentz invariant as that. If it's got external gluons, then every external gluon needs one polarization vector per term, right? If it's got fermions, it'll be fermion bilinears. And so it's got to have the right little group scalar. We will give the most arbitrary guess and parameterize with parameters that are as of yet unconstrained, okay? Now, realistically, you tend to know a lot about the building blocks of a theory after you start working in a theory for a while. So you don't have to write down, in general, the most general onsatz. Sometimes you can write down very specific onsatz, right? But in principle, if you don't know anything about your theory, then you write down a very general onsatz, okay, based upon what you do know. Fix. Fix the parameters in your guess on symmetries and cuts. Symmetries tend to be fairly generic. Cuts, cuts nail you to the theory you're talking about. OK, this is where letting the particles that cross your, that can cross, this is where things get very specific. And any functional relations that you can come up with that let you relate the kinematic weights of one topology to the kinematic weights of another topology only make your life simpler. OK? And this is where something like the duality between color and kinematics can help. OK. Can I see a show of hands for people who have heard of the duality between color and kinematics? Oh, good. That's great. That is a much bigger show of hands than the last time I was in Boulder at Atazi asking if people have heard about the duality between color and kinematics. Um, There's a lot to be said about, about color kinematics duality. And I'll be saying a lot about it. But, but, but for our purposes here, right now, it's something that helps us minimize the number of parameters we need to give to an onsatz. All right? So I'm giving a guess, right? And so in principle, I have to give a guess to each independent topology I write down. That doesn't necessarily sound that great, right? Um, if you think about if you think about the type of headaches involved with um, with off-shell gravitational Feynman rules, if you care about gravity at all, it's it's still better. It's still better. It's still better than going after things with Feynman rules. The same way that playing 20, 20 questions, like people can still win that game, right? Even, you know, because you're just asking questions. This, uh, all right, if somebody is ridiculous with 20, if you're playing against some opponent who is just horrendous, then, and you don't limit what they get to think about, then they can choose an arbitrary length integer over some other arbitrary length. And you'll never get there no matter how many questions you ask. But, but generally, you know, a person plays the thing, you know, it's, oh, it's a toaster oven. So, I mean, it's, it's it, in general, for the types of physical theories we're talking about, these types of constraints cut through the space very quickly, right? It's because there tends to be structure underlying things, 
And so here's an example of structure that does underlie things. Uh, and, and it's, uh, ooh, I'm just looking for, I'm just looking for more color. Okay, so. So. Adjoint type color rates. Right, so this is when I'm dressing things with FABCs. The color weight of this guy equals the color weight of This guy plus the color weight of this guy. Now let me highlight the edges that are relevant. Okay. Now, what do I mean by the color weights of these topologies? I mean, you take each topology, you dress them with FABCs, and you sum over repeated indices, right? Okay, so why would the color weight of this guy be the color weight of this guy plus the color weight of this guy? The Jacobi identity. So, so the structure constants of Lie algebras, they satisfy anti they satisfy Jacobi. Okay, and so maybe you'll re remember, I don't know, from rotation in quantum mechanics or something, but, but, um, but this is a true thing. Uh, F, A, B, E, F. I'm just gonna write down the only connections that are distinct. You'll notice the connections for these diagrams, other than the pink line, right, other than the two vertices connected by the pink line, are exactly the same in all three diagrams. Yeah? Do you see it? I'll let you work that out on your own time. I'm just gonna write down the, the color weight associated with the highlighted edge. Sorry, do you have some labeling in your mind? I do. A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. Wait a second. That's not right. Hold on. C, A, D, B. That's right. F C A E F E D B. Can you guys? I probably wrote that too small. I'll write that a little bigger. A B E E C D D A E E B C C A E E D B. Yeah, with Fs. Plus, the E is this repeated, and if you like, this is a different E. This could be E twilde, and this would be E, right? Because it's repeated over, it doesn't, right? Okay, but this is something, this is something, this is something that uh, structure constant, the structure constants do for, the, the adjoint color weights do for a living. They satisfy Jacobi there. And a symmetric, they satisfy Jacobi. Because of this, the number of color weights you have at any given loop order is much, much, much smaller than the number of distinct topologies, the number of distinct color weights, right? In fact, you can go, once you invoke uh, certain things about, like, so for example, if you're an SUN, there are tricks you can use to actually go down to a very, very small number of, of, of distinct color weights. Um, it turns out that for many theories, 
you can find representations where your kinematic weights obey the same relations as the relevant color weights for the particles and topologies of the graph. I drew adjoint here, right? There are commutator relations for, uh, for, for, uh, for generators um, in arbitrary representations. Uh, and there are interesting types of color weights that have nothing to do with FABCs, right, that one can write down. And, set, I'll be there a and satisfying color kinematics means finding the algebraic relations that let you write down kinematic weights that satisfy those color weights. Now, good. Can I answer a question? Yes. Yeah, so if we don't have the kinematic weights such that like, we can just sum the two E's together to be some, like, oh. why, why do we care about the Okay, good. That's a, that, so so we're going we're gonna to learn much more about this in general. When I wrote the ends, I want you to ignore, because the ends don't care about color at all. They just care about kinematics, right? And so what we find is that this topology with external, like if you can satisfy color kinematics, this topology is given by this topology alone, but with different labels, right? So if I can, I don't have to give an ansatz to this guy, I just have to give an ansatz to this topology. If I give an ansatz to this topology, I can dress this expression, and then I know what kinematic weight is associated with this topology, okay? I only drew color labels to make it clear what type of, what type of color Jacobi I was considering for things in the adjoint, okay? In general, we're going to talk about things that aren't necessarily of adjoint type. Um, and, uh, and there are theories where I don't know how to find a color dual representation for. Okay? And so, so this, is, this isn't always possible, but when you can start relating, when you can start relating um, kinematic weights to other kinematic weights, that drastically simplifies what you have to do in order to calculate a given loop order, uh, even at the integrand level, right? Um, and with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it. And so what we'll do next time is we're going to start at three points, and we're going to start actually deriving scattering amplitudes from thought alone and symmetry principles. All right.